Okay, the recording is started. Good morning, once again. Welcome to BC110 to the course on identity, identity in Christ. <clears throat> so I requested you all to study on section 9. Those of you who have studied, what was your understanding on section 9? Anyone from the class, from the online, what was your understanding on section 9, which talks about the children and the joint heirs with Christ? What's your understanding? You would like to speak into the mic? Where's the mic, guys? In being called the daughters and sons of God, uh, we have the access to the inheritance that he has given to us. We have the access to? The inheritance. The inheritance? Of what God is wanting to give to us. Okay, what God has given to us. Okay. Okay. Anyone else would like to share? Anyone from online would like to share? What is your understanding on section 9 on the children and joint heirs with Christ? So let's move on to Galatians chapter 3. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Even before we could start, let's pray. Father, we come into your presence with thanks and praise. Lord, we pray that we submit ourselves, each and every student, myself into your hand. We pray that you will increase us in your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Lord, everything that you're teaching us today in this session. Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand the revelation of your word and apply it into our life, Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing it so. Lord, I pray that you will speak in and through me. Name of Jesus. Amen. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. It says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing to Galatians and he's saying, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So what is Paul trying to say? OK, so we have Prince here. Prince is saying, because you have put your trust, put your faith on Jesus Christ, now you have become the sons of God. So this is what Paul is saying, compared to what been taught among the Galatians. So this was a very revolutionary statement that has been made by Apostle Paul. He's saying in the traditional Jewish thinking, it is related to the traditional Jewish thinking that our standing before God is measured by our obedience to the law. That our standing before God was measured by our obedience to the law. So truly, for us to be close to God, and for us to be considered as the sons of God, we have to be extremely observant to the law. So what Paul is saying here, this is what the scribes and the Pharisees were saying in the Gospel of Matthew, like, you need to observe the law. You need to follow the Sabbath. You need to keep certain things, rituals. But here Paul is making a statement. For us to be considered as a son of God, this, 
is in a completely different way. How? Not by observing the law, not by you know strictly following by the rituals that has been set, but putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So there is an action, but the action is very different. It's getting your personal self connected to God through Jesus Christ by having faith on Him. So the method is very impressive. How? To become a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It means it is much more than believing. Much more. It's not just faith or belief. It's much more. You need to you need to understand that's real. That's real. That is a real relationship that we have in God. When you when we believe Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, when we put a belief and trust, now you have become the sons of God. You have become the child of God. The sonship which was lost at the very beginning due to sin, due to the fall of man, is now been restored back through Jesus Christ. And this is real. And we need to believe that. How? By renewing our mind. Not by any ritualistic act, not by following something, not by a hard work. This is not something that we deserve. But this is something that has been freely given to us by God himself. So we need to know what happens when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We become the son of God. So it is for us to put our trust in Jesus. For now and for eternity, you have this relationship. What is it? The sonship. The sonship, what you have, what has been restored through Jesus Christ is your new identity. And this is real. This is real identity because that which was lost is been now restored, and this restoration is for eternal. This can only happen when we believe. Paul is saying it is much more than belief, much more than having a faith. It is much more. Why? Because it is your eternal, it is the eternal identity. So you need to think, I am into God's kingdom. This is my new birth and I have my new identity and this is real and forever. Now, if somebody tells you, you, you do, don't belong to this family, this is not your mom and dad, you know this is your mom and dad. If somebody says you don't belong, it, it is very difficult for you to accept it. Isn't it? Because you know that you are being birthed into this family. These are your parents. You have the medical records. You know everything. So it is something like that. You have been born into this family. You have been birthed into the kingdom of God. And this is your family. This is your relationship that you have with the father is your father. You have that sense within you. Why? The Spirit of the Lord who is living inside you gives you that sense of relationship, gives you the sense of the sonship, that you are the son and you are the daughter of the Most High God. You get the sense within you. Because you have put your faith on Jesus Christ. This is what... John also says, can we turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1? Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Can I request one of you all to please read? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Thank you. So what does John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 say? It 
says, as many as received him, as many received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So what is it? What's the idea of receiving Jesus? What the scripture says is valid. Scripture says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. You are the child of God when you receive Jesus. This is what the scripture says. So if the scripture is says, is scripture is saying that it is right. When we receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior, we have now become the child of God. So we need to embrace this truth. We need to receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior and believe in this truth. Because this is what it says. As many as received, is it's just another saying, those who believe in the name of Jesus. Those who believe, those who put their trust in the name of Jesus have a new relationship in the kingdom of God. So what is needed here? Faith. The word receive is nothing but we putting our faith in the name of Jesus. So it is something like this. We are not toiled for it. We have not worked hard to earn this relationship. But it is a free gift given to us. What is the free gift given to us? Eternal relationship, eternal sonship. You become the child of God, child of the Most High God. Now we have given the highest position that has been seated the right hand of God through Jesus Christ. That position which was not available to us through Adam, but now it is available to us through Jesus Christ. Now, how did we get this position? A sonship position. That place, the right hand of God, the place at the right hand of God is given to his beloved son. It's been reserved for his beloved son. Now, you and I, through Jesus Christ, have become the child of God. Not only just the child of God, like one among the others. No, we have been given the same position what has been given to Jesus Christ in him. Now, when we believe Jesus as a Lord and Savior, receive him into us, now we have been restored back to that relationship, the child of God, the children of God. And where we are seated, we are seated at the right hand of God in Jesus Christ. So we have become one with Jesus. This is what it says in John 15, isn't it? When you abide in me, I abide in you. We have become one. You know, many people witness. You know, when we study the history, many say, Paul, Apostle Paul has never seen Jesus. Apostle Paul has never seen Jesus. Yes, we had 12 disciples who were with Jesus, they saw Jesus. But those who were with Jesus, who walked with him, that is the disciples, started to look like him. Started to look like him. That's why when the Roman soldiers came, uh, when the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they could not identify him. They asked, who is Jesus here? Jesus was moving among them, isn't it? He was preaching, teaching. He was one among the public. But what happened? When you relate yourself with Jesus, you become like him. Though Apostle Paul did not see Jesus, though maybe others did not see Jesus, but the relationship what Apostle Paul had with Jesus, you know, people witness him like, he looks like Jesus and he 
talks like Jesus. Now, it was not only back then, even now, the people, the servant of God, when you see, uh, when you uh, read in God's general, those who walked in love with God, who started sharing the gospel and ministering to people about Jesus, people have witnessed them. Though we have not seen Jesus, the person in person, but now we could see Jesus or we could hear Jesus through this person. Many people witness like that. One such that has been recorded in the God's general in the church history is Sadhu Sundar Singh from India, who lived in Punjab. He's a man from a different faith who received Jesus as a Lord and Savior. And he, start, uh, he transformed his life and he lived like how Jesus lived. And when he went different places to share the word, when people looked at him, people stated that he looked like Jesus, and he spoke like Jesus, and he lived like him. So what happens to us? When we put our faith, when we put our trust, when we believe in Jesus, we reflect him in and through us. So what is the spirit of the Lord who is living in us is doing? He is working in us. We are work in progress. How? For us to become more like Jesus. The spirit of the Lord who is living in us is leading us to be more like Jesus. That's when, when we start responding, when we start seeking God and trying to, you know, uh, do things that pleases Him, you see, you are becoming more like Jesus. People around you will start witnessing that you look like Jesus, you talk like Jesus, you witness more of Him. Why? Because we have the Christ, we have the Spirit of the Lord who is living inside us. So this is what we get to know from this scripture. The word children means born one, who are born new into the family of God. So believers who are born new, these are the little ones, these are the children who have been born into God's family, who have been birthed into God's family. And here John reminds us of the nature of the birth. What is the nature of the birth that John reminds us? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what is he saying here? Those who receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior are born of God. So we are born of God. Not with the human effort or the achievements. It is a spiritual birth. As you have been born real into this world as a human, it's so real that you have been born in God. It's so real that you have been born of God into the spiritual kingdom. The relationship what you have with God is so real that you are the child of. God. God is abiding in you and you in Him. Your way of life, the thought of life is now different. This new birth is something that actually brings a change into your life. You are a new person. You are a new being. Maybe outwardly, your skin color, height, weight has, may not have changed, but the inside person, the spirit man, has been born new. He's new in the Lord. Now, his thoughts, his way of life is new. He is not the same as you were before. You are not the same. Now, you try to live according to God. Now you see the fruit of the Spirit has become your identity. Now what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, 
peace, patience, joy, self-control, endurance, long-suffering, then gentleness. These are your fruits. Now your life will try to live according to that pleases God, in the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the scripture says, no? You will know the tree by its fruit. Now, what fruit are we bearing? We are been, we believe in Jesus. We have received him as the Lord and Savior. So if you are into God's kingdom, if you are a child of God, now how our life should be? Shouldn't it reflect the fruit of the Spirit? Yes or no? Our way of life should show, should reflect the fruit of the Spirit. We should be in the reflection of Christ, isn't it? Because we are the child of God. We are in the sonship with Christ, with God. So when John chapter 15 says, when you abide in me, and I abide in you. We have become one. Now we need to allow the nature of Christ to grow into this person, into this new child. So how do we grow? It is a intentionally, it is a process. Intentionally, you will see to it that you do not do the things that you were doing before. You will start doing the right things that pleases God. So there is an effort, there is a decision that we need to make. What is the decision? The decision that we need to make that pleases God. Now you decide, I have a new identity. I have this new relationship with God. I am a child of God. So as a child of God, there are certain things that displeases God, which I need to put away. I need to put away. And if there are certain things that I need to hold on to, I need to embrace this. So that is a decision that you need to make. The decision that you make is what will bear a good fruit in each of us. So the tree is known by its fruit. The nature, what has been displayed in and through us in our daily life different instances with all people around us has been displayed. So what is the nature that we carry is something that we need to ponder and think of because you do not have the relationship what you used to have before. Now you are a child of God. Your identity is in Christ. So with this new identity, what fruit are we bearing? is something that we need to think and ponder. Am I doing the right things in my life? Am I bearing the right fruit? Am I showing, am I reflecting Christ's likeness in my life with everyone around me? In my ministry, in my workplace, my family, my friends? For those who are married, with our kids, with our spouse, with our in-laws, are we showcasing Christ's likeness in us? This is something that we need to ponder and think of. Why? Because if, uh, uh, just an illustration, okay? If you take a watch to the mechanic, the watch has some kind of problem. You're taking the watch to a mechanic. Now, the mechanic has not done anything. Your watch looks the same. The dial, the hand, everything looks the same. But what did the mechanic do? The mechanic worked with the machine that is inside. Inside. He has fixed certain parts that was not working well before. He has fixed it. He has worked inside the inward part of the watch. He has fixed it and he has given that watch to you. Now the watch is set right and it is working perfectly fine. Now what is the change in the watch? It looks the same. The chain, the dial, the hand, 
everything is same and now it's working fine in the way a watch need to be worked it's showing the right time it's moving the second uh, uh, hand is ticking correctly the uh, uh, short hand and the long hand is moving perfectly fine with the rhythm how a clock needs to function so what was the change the change was in the change was inward the same way when we receive jesus as a lord and savior the spirit of the lord we have invited him inside now he is setting things right inwardly in our mind in our heart in our inward spirit setting things right that which was not functioning or working well before but now it has been set right it has been set right to perform well now our life which has been set right by the spirit of the lord who's working in us it's it should only bring glory to god so we need to check our life is every action every word and deed of us is it bringing glory to god we need to check that we need to ponder on us why because we are not the same person who we were before we have a new identity now this identity does not depend on the opposite person how well they behave this does not depend on others or on your circumstance for your behavior we need to set things right now the climate is hot outside humid can your clock work differently now due to the weather the climate has changed the clouds have become dark and it's completely it looks like night though it is day it is what what's the time now okay in india it is 11:30 am because of the weather change we have a thick dark cloud covering so it looks like evening maybe 6:37 just because it's looking that way did a clock change the timing did it change it looks that way you also feel it's like evening but did the watch timing change did the clock timing change no the clock works exactly in the way it is programmed so if a clock can work how much more you and i can work greater is he who is in us the lord is in us he is strengthening us through his grace and through his strength can we not react to the opposite person's behavior in a very pleasant way can we not react to the situation that is around us can we show christ likeness in that terrier to that person to that circumstances human nature is designed to rebel but we are not in that nature now isn't it the christ in us we have a new identity this is what jesus thought us is, isn't it if one slaps a cheek he saying us to show another cheek which is not human the human nature is for one eye given a take of another eye isn't it evil for evil but here the scripture is teaching us to do good don't repay evil with evil but repay it with good so this is the new nature that christ is asking us to apply it in our self mike shawn has a question or yeah you want to say something so i just wanted to add to the eye to an eye a tooth for a tooth the saying that um 
I think I may be wrong, but I think that's how we used. I mean, it used to be in the Old Testament, but then when he came the New Testament, he said, the Lord said that it's no, it shouldn't be no longer for an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, but it should be, you know, a new a good thing for a good a good thing. It shouldn't be if you pay if someone pays it, he will pay it back with good. Thanks, Sean. Yes, that's how in the Old Testament people used to live, but in the New Testament. What does our father say? Forgive, forgive others as I have been forgiven. Then God forgive us. Though we were not perfect, God has forgiven us. His grace is so much that He has forgiven us. So now God is asking, as I forgive you, you forgive others. And also, he says, "Love your neighbor as you love yourself." That neighbor can be anybody, maybe your enemy, maybe your friend, but at the end of the day, is your neighbor. So you should love him. Yes, thanks, Sean. Yes, that is one of the commandments, right? Jesus gave in the two commandments. One was, "Love your neighbor as yourself." As Sean said, the neighbor can be anyone. The neighbor can be. Anyone, so we need to love. Why? Because God, and this love of God is within us. Romans eight twenty eight says, "Can we turn to Romans eight twenty eight to thirty? Can I have you all read slowly? You all can turn to Romans eight twenty eight to thirty, and I want one person to read it slowly." Sean, are you reading? Romans 8, chapter verse 28. Yeah. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God had already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many believers. And so those whom God set apart, he called, and those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. Yeah, thank you. So we see that. In Romans 8.28, it starts by saying, We know that all things work together for good. We see that God's sovereignty and His ability to manage every aspect of our life. We see that. And it has been also demonstrated in the very fact of His work. By saying, together for good to those who love God. There is a condition there. To those who love God. Though we must face the suffering times, in the present time, but God is confirming us that He is able to make even those suffering work together for our good work. So God is more than able to change our situation and circumstances for our good. We may get ourselves deviated and move away sometimes or go astray from God's need, from God's plan. But here God is saying, when you look at me, when you call upon my name, when you love me. Now, because you love God is when you will look at Him and you will call Him. No matter how far 
that circumstance or that situation would have taken each of us far from God. But God is saying, just like the prodigal son, just like the uh, parable of the lost sheep, the minute the sheep calls, the shepherd hears the sheep's voice and he runs. So all that the sheep did was one step. One step, what the shepherd did. It took that 99 step to reach that sheep. The same way, no matter how far we would have gone in our life, in our journey, away from God's plan, what God has designed for you and me, but your God is saying, the minute you call upon my name, I will answer you. And everything that you suffered, everything that you went through, I am more than able to make that turn it to your good. To your good. I have a plan. What is the plan in Jeremiah 29, 11? Plan to prosper you, to give you success. From the very beginning, God works for his children to prosper them, to multiply them, to make them fruitful in every area. This is God's plan and this is God's design for you and me. This is what again in Romans 8.28, it's been confirmed to us saying that we know that in all things, it works together for our good, for those who love God. So God is able to work out all things. It's not just some area. Every area of our life, we can make it a blessing when we surrender to God. Are we keeping any area hidden from God? We need to check. If there are certain areas you don't see the hand of God in your life, we need to recheck. We need to recheck. Have I submitted that area to God? Have I asked God to help me in that weakness? Have I invited God to help me overcome in that area? If that was your prayer, you see that area change and transform to God's glory. You see how God can change and He can make that work for your good. The very area that you struggled, the very area that you will look down, when you surrender that area to God and ask Him to help you in that area, He will not only help you to overcome, but He will make you uh, uh, raise you as a witness in that area where you can help others. He will raise you to be a blessing in that area to others. You see how God can turn that to your good and make you a blessing to others? So this is what the scripture says. Scripture says when you love God, when you love God, you see the hand of God move on your behalf. You see the hand of God help you overcome everything and he will, cha he will, ch he will change it for his glory. Scripture also says to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So it is our participation is required in the eternal plan of God. It is very important and it is very essential for us to take part into this God's plan. So how do we take part? By inviting God, by asking his help. by doing the right things and asking God, you help me so that we can fulfill God's purpose into our life so that we might be, con we might be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So is this one day process? It is a lifelong process. Every time you fall, you say, Lord, help me. Don't give up. That's not our nature. That's not in our DNA. The DNA of God is never to give up because God is not giving up. When God is not giving up, we should not. The scripture says, when you are weak, 
then you are strong. In our weakest moment is where you can experience the greater power of God. Your weakest moment. Many instances in the scripture we see when we read from the Old Testament and also the disciples in the New Testament. In the weakest moment, they sought the Lord and the Lord strengthened them. When Jesus was on this earth, he found himself very weak and vulnerable. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, God, if it is your will, move this cup. So what did Jesus do in his weakest moment? He prayed. He knelt down. He asked God for help. What did God do? Did he abandon him there? No. God comforted Jesus by sending his angel. Check out his disciples. In the weakest moment, they cried out to God. After the death of Jesus, they always scattered into different places. They were filled with fear. Fear is not from God. They were so scared of their life. What did they do? They all came together one day. In the upper room, they gathered together. And what did they do? They prayed, Lord, lead us, guide us. How are we going to take this great commission that you have given to us? We are so scared. We are so fearful. You help us. When they cried out with one cord and one mind, what happened? God sent his comforter. The Holy Spirit was poured out on them. The same people few seconds before, few minutes before, who were so fearful, they were hiding for their life. Now, when they receive the Comforter, when they receive the Holy Spirit, are filled with courage and boldness. The same Peter who betrayed Jesus three times, saying that, I do not know him, now he is standing in front of the 3,000 people and addressing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, where did this boldness come from? A fisherman who do not know how to speak, a fisherman may not carry the wisdom that he is speaking with that now. How did he get this wisdom? From where? He do not have any knowledge like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But from where did he get this, what he is sharing with the 3,000 people? The courage, the boldness, the word, the wisdom, the understanding that he has, that he is sharing the word, comes from God. The weakest moment, when we see God, he becomes our strength. He becomes our strength. That's what happens when we have the sonship relationship with God. We become more like Jesus. Every area, every act of our life will reflect the sun. Will reflect the sun. Can we today ask God, God, we are the child of God. We have been adopted into your kingdom as sons and daughters. This adoption is not like the adoption, like you were not born of the family. We are taking you. No, this adoption is being born into the family of God. You have been birthed into the family of God. You have the birthright. You have the inheritance of God. You have been seated in the highest position through Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. With this, we can ask God, God, change me from within so that I may reflect you. I may reflect your son, Jesus Christ, in every area. Lord, I invite you into the weakest point, the weakest area in my life. Here I am. Submit to God every area of your life to God and invite God. When you invite the Spirit of the Lord who is in you, 
will enable you to overcome. Can we do that today, please? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the work that he did on the cross, for the restoration of a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the great plan that you had from the very beginning towards restoring each of us, Lord. We are destined to be your child. We are destined to be your son, your daughter. Thank you for the great plan that you have in store for us. You are a God who's mindful of good things for us, Lord. Thank you for revealing it to us in time. Thank you that you have chosen us from the very beginning, Lord. Thank you that you knit us together in our mother's womb. That we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Thank you that your eye is always upon us. That you are leading us and guiding us. That you, have, you, you never forsake us, Lord. Even in our weakest moment, when we look up to you and call Abba, Father, you are there to strengthen us. You are there to lead us. You are there to lift us up. You are there to forgive us. You are there to strengthen us. You are there to restore us, restored back to the same position that we had before. Thank you, Lord. Father, I surrender each and every student and to those who watch later. Lord, I pray that you will minister to each one of us, that you will strengthen us. Help us to be mindful of you, Lord, as you are mindful of us, that we will be able to do what pleases you. Thank you for the deep love that you have over us, Lord. No matter what, that you will never give up on us. Thank you for that strength. Thank you for that relationship. Thank you for this new identity, Lord, that you're enabling us to be more like Jesus. Thank you that you will strengthen us so that we can reflect Christ in every area of our life, Lord. Jesus, for who you are in us is who we really are. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, each one, for joining in today's session. God bless. I hope it was a blessing, and I pray that we will apply everything that we study, everything that we study in our life. Thank you. God bless.